Final Fantasy VII Remake is packed full of various references to the original game, but this will come as no surprise to many of you, as, well, it is a remake of a widely regarded property, and quite a few of the original development staff have returned to work on this new vision. Many of these references are therefore fundamental, as without them the game would feel too different from the source material, but there are also many easter eggs and homages thrown in that don't have an active role in building out the world, and they are often quite subtle. Some of these do still have a connection with the original game, while others make reference to wider properties from the franchise, and even the real world. But despite there being quite a few that made the final cut, there is unfortunately no recurrence of the Lucky 7's easter egg from the original. Our first reference can be found hidden within photo frames on the wall of the 7th Heaven Bar, and it definitely falls into that first category of having a connection to the original game. Tifa's Bar was a pretty iconic location within Final Fantasy VII. Not only was it a place where the various residents of Sector VII could go and drown their sorrows, it was also the base of operations for Avalanche, thanks to the hidden layer underground. But what's interesting is that the developers went through numerous design revisions before settling on the version we finally saw in the game. Within the remake, the designers tried their best to be faithful to the original concept, but there were, of course, some modifications made to adapt it to the more realistic graphical style. This saw more tables and chairs added, but one of the more interesting modifications was pictures on the wall. These contained various photos, but upon closer inspection, two of the photo frames right at the back of the bar contained the original designs of the inside and outside of the 7th Heaven Bar. It was a nice nod to what had come before, but this kind of easter egg was also nothing new for the franchise, and it actually served as an homage to something else they had within the original game. If you watched our Final Fantasy VII Facts video, you'd know that this is because within the original game there was a picture of Hironobu Sakaguchi, the father of Final Fantasy, hung up in a photo frame that appeared on the wall of a house in Rocket Town. There was also a whole host of nods that can be found right at the start of the game in the Sector 1 train station. The first happens right after completing the initial tutorial battle. Cloud will attain level 7, and this is a purposeful act that links in with the game's number and the wider association it has with the number 7. When heading inside, if you take a look around, you can see numerous posters strewn throughout the location, and each serves to enrich the experience in slightly different ways. The first is the Venora White poster. This is, of course, a reference to the apples that were featured within Crisis Core as a prominent plot device for Genesis. The poster states that Benora White apple juice is delicious, fresh, and healthy. Benora White posters also appeared in Final Fantasy XV, no doubt due to Hajime Tabata serving as the director of Crisis Core. Another poster is advertising hair tonic that's ideal for scalp care. It's recommended for those who are looking to achieve astonishingly radiant and spiky hair, which suggests it's a product Cloud utilises on a regular basis. This could again be a funny reference back to Crisis Core, where details were revealed about the types of hair product that Sephiroth uses, and you can find out more about that one within our Sephiroth Facts video. There's also a poster advertising a camera that uses Shinra X sensor technology. This seems pretty innocuous, but it's actually a nod to an odd piece of promotional material that was produced for Final Fantasy XV called Cat Cam. This saw a cat running about a train station with the premise of being able to play the game from the perspective of a cat. And lastly, there's the Elegance poster, which has to serve as a nod to Lightning, the main protagonist of the Final Fantasy XIII trilogy. Elegance is a word Square Enix have often used when describing Lightning, and the handbag is no doubt an extra dimension to this reference as it brings in the Series 4 campaign Louis Vuitton ran in 2016 where Lightning was used as a digital model. Our next easter egg sees two different Tetsu Nomura properties connected. Numerous comments have been made about similarities between Final Fantasy VII Remake and Kingdom Hearts, but the most tangible one comes from something you collect throughout your playthrough, the Moogle Medals. You can find Moogle Medals by breaking Shinra boxes, opening chests, and also by taking part in the Wacker Box minigame. They can then be cashed in for numerous treats at the Moogle Emporium after the completion of the Budding Bodyguard side quest in Chapter 8. It made for a pretty neat system, but this was not the first appearance of Moogle Medals within a Square Enix game. They first appeared in Kingdom Hearts Unchained Key, before then transferring over to Union Key. And within this game, different tiers of Moogle Medal could be collected and then exchanged, except this time they were exchanged for in-game currency as opposed to items. 
Another fun little nod can be seen towards the end of the game during chapter 16, and it helps to further stoke the connection that the creators have said exists between Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy X. This all started way back in 2001 when Square Enix published the Final Fantasy X Scenario Ultimania. Within, it was inferred that a connection between the two universes existed. And this notion was explored in more detail when the Final Fantasy X Ultimania Omega released a year later. It was revealed that the initial comment came after Nojima and Toriyama had explored the possibility of expanding the story of Final Fantasy VII, specifically in relation to the ambiguous 500 year gap in the ending. Nojima also felt that he could form a connection due to the Pyreflies in the livestream drawing from the same basic concept, and this saw them investigate using Final Fantasy X as something of a pseudo-sequel with future properties. Kitase said he didn't take the suggestion too seriously at the time, but as he stepped away from active involvement and handed the reins over to Toriyama for Final Fantasy X 2, a more real connection started to form. When X 2 then released in 2003, it featured a science prodigy named Shinra. On the surface, this appeared to be a nice nod to what had come before, but within the Final Fantasy X 2 Ultimania, Nojima expanded on numerous hints dotted throughout the game itself that pointed to a connection between the universes of 7 and 10. He said after the game, Shinra quits the Gullwings, receives enormous financial assistance from Rin, and uses Vegnagun to extract Mako energy from the far plane. However, he can't complete the system to utilize the energy in a single generation, and the Shinra company is built on another planet in the future once travel to distant worlds is possible, and stuff like that. These things happen around 1000 years after this story though. At the time, this was just a concept, but Nojima then implemented the first part of this concept within Last Mission, but he stopped short of implementing anything further that would position one game as either a sequel or a prequel to the other. Within the Final Fantasy VII Remake, they decided to stoke the flames again, and this was done in the form of a picture of the founders of Shinra. This picture can be found when undertaking the museum tour towards the end of the game, and you can clearly see that the person in the middle of the picture is wearing an Albed face mask. Take this however you want, but since both Toriyama and Nojima were heavily involved with forging this connection in the first place, it isn't too surprising to see something crop up within the Final Fantasy VII Remake given their prominent roles on the project. Now, Wall Market is a place bustling with personality. There are so many nooks and crannies, and it's here that you'll meet a vast array of NPCs like Chocobo Sam and Madame M, but two in particular have a connection with the real world. After progressing through the chapter, you'll need to venture into the gym to complete the side quest, and it's here that you'll meet Jules and his two star-studded students, Ronnie and Jay. The first iteration of this quest will see you undertake the squat challenge with Cloud before coming back to undertake the pull-up challenge with Tifa, and Ronnie and Jay serve as the appetizers in both of these mini-games before you end up having to take on Jules in the final challenge. These sequences feature some pretty funny dialogue, as Ronnie and Jay are often confused at how they ended up losing, and this helps to balance out the two minigames, which sometimes can get a little frustrating. But no pain, no gain, right? And that's where it relates back to the real world, because Ronnie and Jay are loosely based on real people, the famous bodybuilders Ronnie Coleman and Jay Cutler. Ronnie Coleman is regarded as one of the best bodybuilders of all time. He won Mr. Olympia eight years in a row, a feat not matched by anyone else, not even Arnold Schwarzenegger. But his reign was ended by his longtime rival Jay Cutler in 2006, and he went on to win a further three titles. Given its prominence, it's perhaps no surprise that Don Corneo's Colosseum also houses some interesting references and homages to the past, outside of Scotch and Koch being given a much more prominent role than they had in the original. The Colosseum first becomes available as part of the quest to gain entry to Don Corneo's mansion, and it features some really cool fights, with an interesting twist arriving at the end. But if you happen to venture back afterwards to take on some optional fights, you will bear witness to a nice nod from the original game, as upon completing fights, the characters will line up with their classic victory poses. Within the Colosseum, there's also another, perhaps more subtle nod. This is available after defeating Hell House and gaining access to Madame M's side quests as opposed to Chocobo Sam's. To do this, you need to ignore Johnny's discovery quest, say no deal to Chocobo Sam, and also get the luxury massage from Madame M. After beating Ronnie at squats, you'll then be sent to the Colosseum again for a special battle, and it's named Shears' Counter-Attack. This could well be a reference to one of the main members of Avalanche who featured in Before Crisis Final Fantasy VII, but it's not reflected within the Japanese version, so it may have just been a fun nod that was added during the English localization. 
And that brings us to the grand finale, something we've reserved for another easter egg related to Don Corneo. Towards the latter half of the game, you will gain access to a side quest called Corneo's Secret Stash. Partway through this, you will gain access to another side quest called Tomboy Bandit, and if this is completed, you will acquire Don Corneo's key. There are three stashes in total, and each one houses plenty of treasures, but there are three in particular that are of notable import, the tiaras, and these are pretty cool for numerous reasons. In the initial sense, they act as a subtle nod to Cloud's attempts to gain access to Don Corneo's mansion in the original game. Much like in the remake, the materia shop owner asks Cloud to acquire an item from the vending machine, and depending on which one you return with, he would either give you a glass tiara, ruby tiara, or a diamond tiara, with the diamond tiara being the best. Within the remake, the glass tiara was switched out for an emerald tiara, and this was done for a specific reason as upon closer inspection, the tiaras have been given distinct designs that make reference to the formidable weapons who appeared within the original game. What's also cool is that these are not the only items to have their designs influenced by other parts of the franchise. The circlet, for example, is an almost carbon copy of what Adia Kramer wore within Final Fantasy VIII, and this, of course, makes perfect sense as a reference as Adia was a character that Nomura initially designed for use in the original Final Fantasy VII, before she was then repurposed, for use in Final Fantasy VIII. Now, there are no doubt many more subtle and well-hidden references littered throughout the Final Fantasy VII Remake, but we hope you really enjoyed finding out about the ones we've mentioned here and the backstory as to why they were put in the game. If you did, then please consider subscribing to our channel and supporting us on Patreon. There's a link in the description below. We'd also love to hear if there are any cool Easter eggs that you've noticed as you've played through the game, so let us know in the comments. Alright guys, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.